Amen. Thank you, Ron. <clears throat> We're going to be in 1 Peter 2, appropriately. Um, we forgot to announce the uh, uh, National Day of Prayer. We're going to be praying here on uh, this Thursday, um, May 3rd. See Marty Nall. Is Marty here? I think she's back there. She's back there. See Marty Nall. <laughs> right there. See Marty Nall for any questions, but uh, somewhere here on the church grounds here this Thursday, May 3rd at some time during the day that that day is. 7 p.m. I knew that. 7 p.m. Right? 7 p.m. Thursday, May 3rd, National Day of Prayer. Our country needs prayer. Whew. Yes. Amen. Okay. Second, uh, First Peter chapter 2. Um, let's get into this. It's been an exciting um, study for me personally. Um, verse 9, but you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are a people belonging to God. Why? What are you supposed to do? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful, wonderful light. Welcome to Christianity. If you're a believer, if you have trusted Jesus, he died on the cross for your sins. He rose again, defeating death and Satan and sin. Uh, welcome to Christianity. Welcome to the church. This is what we do. We declare the praises together, together. We worship together. The God who saves us, we worship. Uh, the key word being together, the key word being us. Because uh, note this, important, you are part of a bigger picture. You are part of a community. You are not alone. You are part of a spiritual house that Peter calls it in the earlier verses, verse 5 particularly. You are part of a spiritual house. Your life is not to be done in isolation. You are a stone being built into a spiritual house. A good worship song this morning should have been Jed. Uh, all in all, we are just another brick in the wall. Pra <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I forgot how that song goes. Something like that. Uh, you are part of a spiritual house. You are all part of a, the same family. You are all part of the same nation. Listen to this verse. I love this. You are living stones, verse 5, being built into a spiritual house to a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Folks, that's your life. It's not Sunday morning. That's your life. That's not about Sunday a.m. This is how you live. This is what you do. This is who you are. This is your identity. Offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, it happens on Sunday morning, but it should be happening seven days a week. Now, in the context, uh, please know this. Put yourselves in the place of the Christians who are receiving this letter for the first time. Uh, you're being blamed for Rome burning down. Uh, you're being accused of being part of a weird cult. You're being, uh, you are ridiculed, you're humiliated. And if it hasn't started yet, it's going to start happening soon. Someone you know will be killed for the faith. Homes will be confiscated. Uh, they will take away your property. You'll lose all of it. Dispersed and scattered, what does that mean? You're running for your lives. You and your family. Now, in the context, you're saved you're part of a bigger picture. You're part of a community. You are not alone. You're part of a spiritual house that God is building. Uh, you're part of the same family. You're part of the same nation. You are living stones being built into a spiritual house to be a royal priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That's it in the context. That's your life. It's not Sunday morning. It's your whole life. This is what you do. This is who you are. And it's supposed to be an encouragement to you. While your family members are losing their lives and they're taking your homes and your houses and your property, the encouragement, I mean, pretty rough stuff is happening, and the encouragement is, folks, this is not your home. You're only passing through. You're only passing through. Uh, write this down, if you can remember, chapter 2, verse 12, chapter 3, verse 16, chapter 4, 4 verse 16. It's all part of the suffering that's going on to these original believers. You're being accused of doing wrong. You're being maliciously accused. You're suffering. Life stinks. And here's a summary of Peter's encouragement. God saved you. That's the encouragement. While they're taking all your stuff, some of you possibly losing your lives, you're saved. Yippee! Hmm. 
But the point is, you're part of a bigger picture. Uh, and this bigger picture where you fit in will span the whole church age and into eternity. And that's the whole point. So Peter says this, while you're running for your lives, being scattered and dispersed, uh, fulfill your calling. Anybody do the homework again yet? <laughs> Ian's the only one. Okay. Ian, come see me afterwards. You get the... Um, Gold Canyon Community Church, $50 bill pack. Uh, calling number one, God has called you to be holy. Dare to live different. That's what he's called you to do. Uh, calling number two, today, God has called you into the church. Why? So you can de declare the praises. But together, keyword, together. Uh, it's not singing in church, folks. Declaring the praises of God together doesn't mean singing in church, although it includes that. This is your life. And here's the hardest part for you and me, Americans, Western believers, here's the hardest part. The hardest part is the together stuff. Uh, here, here's what I mean. We as Westerners uh, find our identity rooted in our culture. And I'm not saying that's sinful. But what I am saying, it's a possible hindrance into reading the Bible and fleshing out the word. That's what I thought we'd get into today. Here's what I mean. Chapter 2 opens up, uh, grow up, uh, therefore rid yourselves of all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. Remember we talked last week that those are the uh, polite sins, those are the church sins, those are the sins that are going to affect the whole together stuff, the, all the unity. Um, but grow up, and we take it, here's how we hear it, uh, grow up individually. I better get into a Bible study, I better be praying every day, I better be doing my devotional work and dealing with this sin stuff that it affects me because it could impact the church. Um, combating sin is going to be a major theme for Peter. He's going to come back to it, chapter 1, 13, chapter 2, verse 1, chapter 4, 1 through 3. Deal with your sin, grow up, we hear it individually, but it's not done in isolation. You're part of a bigger picture. So hear those verses, combat sin so that the building, so that the temple, so that the priesthood is above reproach and being built up. Basically, do your job, do, fulfill your role so the building is built up. Uh, shine the light that Jesus is, verse 9. But this big, bigger picture living, this together do life thing is tough for us in the USA. Here's where I'm coming from. With the backdrop of suffering, uh, you are stones, you, we are priests, we are citizens of the same nation, you are so important to God, when he saved you, you are a brick in the building God is building. Uh, you're part of a together house, you're part of a together family, you're part of a together nation, and being part of something bigger than you is a hard thing for Westerners. Uh, that's my premise. Community is hard for 21st century Americans. So th th that's what we're going to unwrap this morning. In the context, we need to suffer together. In the context, we need to grow together. In the context, we need to combat sin together. We need to be in pain together. We need to wait for Jesus' return together. We need to worship Jesus Together, we need to love each other deeply together. All of those things are themes that Peter is going to come back to over and over. Okay, I'm going to show you something real quick. Look at this picture. One, two, three, stop! Okay, what did you see? What did you say? Five fish. Anybody else get five fish? What if I tell you he's wrong? Any of you still get five fish? You still get it. Very good. It was, it was five fish. Good job. Don't show it again. Don't show it! Okay, uh, what else did you see? Seaweed. Wait, wait, one, one fish was going in a different direction? Top one was going in a different direction than if there's five, then the other four are going the other way? Okay, what'd you guys say? You agree? Everyone agree? Everyone, anyone disagree with that? Yes. Two go in the other direction and then two go in the, or three go in. Okay, because we said five fish? What thing? This thing was annoying? Oh, shit. Okay, you're right. We're like, there's no money in this, so. 
Okay, very good. Can we move on to someone else now? <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. Good job. Okay, what else did you see? You said three go in one direction, two go in the other. Everyone agrees with Rick. Yeah, okay, what else? What did you say? Good job. Fro Anybody see the frog? No? Greg, good job. Okay, what else? What do you say? Water? <laughs> That's the there's no water in the picture. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, bubbles. Who said bubbles? Good job. People see bubbles? Okay. Uh, show the picture again. You guys did good. Few bubbles. See that? See the frog down at the bottom? Ask her, uh, ask her if she'd like to come up and get close to the picture. Okay, see the frog down at the bottom? Anybody catch uh, there was a snail in the picture. Ian, what'd you do? Did you cut out the snail? Bottom right corner. You see it? Okay. All right. You notice the um, three go in one direction, two the other. Anybody fishermen here? And uh, one of the, uh, this was actually a study done. Some people could actually name the fish. What kind of fish they are? Is that even possible? Trout? Really? You know that? Did someone say walrus? I would say you're, you're wrong. It's not a walrus. Even I know that. <laughs> Walrus. Okay. Uh, per, no, one of them perch? Perch? Okay. That's what the study said. And I said, huh? Can you talk? Are they all perch? Okay. Uh, tilapia. Tilapia. Someone, the only thing someone can see is uh, good eating. Okay. All right. Keep it up for a second. Uh, here, here's the thing with this. Um, uh, they, they showed people this picture, like we just did. Uh, a cognitive scientists did this. They study people. They flash this picture. Uh, what was the picture about? These are some of the questions they would ask and the feedback they would get. How many fish were there? Most of you got that right. Um, uh, somebody said one fish has bubbles. I think a few of them do. Um, three were swimming one direction, two the other. People got that in, the, in this one. The point of this, cognitive scientists, the point of this, they've done experiments with this picture uh, it was shown to some Americans, and it was shown to some Japanese. Yeah. Now, what stood out to the Americans was this. This is what they reported on overwhelmingly was the fish. Americans look at the picture briefly, and the thing that stood out to them were fish details. How many of them? Which direction? Even, like we said, what kind of fish? Some people could even tell what kind of fish. Japanese noticed this. Uh, there's actually a green background. Can you sense the green background in the big picture? Yeah. Japanese noticed backgrounds. They noticed three plants on the left. There's one on the far right. They noticed things like that. They noticed the frog. They noticed the snail. They noticed the, can't see it in this one. Can you see it over here? Uh, the brown shell type bottom. Can you guys see that from that picture? No? The bigger picture they can. Well, it's, there's no Japanese here. It's not like we're offending anyone. But the ja <laughs> Japanese noticed that. We'll cut it off. Okay, Ian. Ian was, Ian was busy doing the homework then working on these pictures. There's, yeah, I'll, I'll show you the picture later, Marty. Marty's upset. She can't see the bottom. Okay, we'll show you. Okay. All right, but the Japanese noticed stuff like that. Now, what's the point? Um, they obviously noticed fish, the Japanese did, but they didn't give a whole lot of detail about the fish. Most, I would say all, um, couldn't even say how many fish there were. Isn't that strange? Yeah. Um, so Americans give most detail about the fish. Japanese, less detail about the fish and more detail about everything else. Why? Why, why this different perspective? Uh, here's why cognitive scientists tell us this. As, as Americans, we notice what stands out. I mean, they do obviously more than a picture of a fish is, uh, fishes. Our brains are conditioned, and here's the key, our brains are conditioned to notice what stands out. We focus on the unique, we focus on individual things, we point out what we think is the most impressive things about the picture. Everything else goes to the periphery of our vision, whereas the Japanese, it's kind of opposite. Uh, Japanese, less focus on individual, and less focus on individual things, and more alert to the whole context. Hear that, more alert to what they're really looking at. What catches their att attention, and here's the key, what catches their attention is the relation 
of all things together, how they fit. Uh, this, they tell us, they tell us anyway, uh, it speaks to what their cultures value. In other words, we're seeing the picture by what we're conditioned to value, and that's how we see it. Japanese, their value is different. Not, 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 neither of them worse or better than the other, but uh, it's, our value systems are going to communicate by what we see, what we notice, what we don't see. We value the individual. We notice what stands out. We notice the unique. We notice the set apart. Think about this culturally now, if that's true. Culturally, uh, we demand uniqueness. Uh, we will fight for our individual rights. Bring it even closer to home, uh, the evangelical Christian voting block. No government is going to tell us what to do. Right? That's how we vote. And the left does that too then. No one tells me about my rights. This is where we're at. It's all stemming from our individuality, non-Westerners, uh, not what stands out. That's not what they're picking. It's, it's the contrast. It's not things in contrast. It's how everything else fits together. Here's what non-Westerners see, value, uniformity, the connectedness of everything. They would rather see, they would rather value how they relate, how they connect, how they fit in with the bigger picture. Our culture, more individualistic, and therefore we value the more individualistic. Uh, I, I, I had the wonderful opportunity to study under a guy named Dr. Malcolm Hartnell. Actually had private meetings with him, brought my father-in-law into one because uh, this guy goes into a certain Islamic country and uh, is thriving there. His mission especially is thriving there. Um, he spent most of his adult life raising, he and his wife raising two kids in, I believe it was Kenya. It was some African country, I believe it was Kenya, and uh, Turkey. And the, they and the kids loved it so much that he can't wait to retire into one of those other two countries. It's not that he's anti-American, he's not. He loves this country. He just fits in better and likes that culture better. And I forget which one he's gonna, I think it might be even uh, the Turkey he might even um, uh, retire to. I took a few classes with this guy, one of them called Cross-Cultural and Diversity Competency. Competency. I can't even say the title, don't ask me my grade. I'm <laughs> just kidding. I aced it. <laughs> uh, listen, um, he, he speaks, in, in this class, he spoke a lot, and I think he writes a lot about the cultural differences. And uh, uh, USA, here, it, um, here's how some non-Western cultures, here, here's what they say, because uniformity is the key. Here, we even pay, pay people millions of dollars if they could sing different, stand out, look different, more athletic, all the other stuff. Uh, Asian, I believe it was Asian or some African cultures, they have a saying, the highest nail gets hit the hardest. Think about that. We love the highest, we would love to be the highest nail. No, the highest nail gets hit the hardest. Uh, think about it. some of these other non-Western cultures, uh, say you have a classroom full of school children. Uh, in the U.S., we're raising our hand first. I mean, most kids are going to raise their hands first if we have the right answer. In other non-Western cultures, if they even know the right answer, they either won't give it or purposely give a wrong answer. Why? They don't want to stand out. They do not want to stand out. Non-Western, they're more communal. It's a more communal, communal, man, I'm having trouble speaking. Commune type living. <laughs> Culture, uh, the, the individual in relation to others, no, they don't like that. Westerners, the individual is in contrast to others. We like that better. As Americans, we obsess a little more over our personal rights, over our personal time, over our personal possessions. It is our culture. We, we, we would say even more passionate about controlling our own personal destiny. I happen to like that. I'm glad I live in a country like that, where we can do our own thing. Uh, I don't think it's a sinful thing to like that. I think we're blessed because of that. Anything that encroach, encroaches on our time or on our rights, it makes us mad. No one's going to tell us what to do. This is going to get even fishier for us, folks, as we move on into this book with an issue called submission. Ooh, we're not good at that, but Peter's going to have a whole lot to talk about submission. Uh, I feel, here's my thing on that, uh, as Americans, we submit as long as we agree. Right? Amen. Amen. But well, we're going to see if that's biblical. Okay. Um, <clears throat> therefore, we're, we're, 
because we have a harder, because we're more about being individualistic and unique and set apart and look at me, I'm different, uh, we're more tentative in building deep, uh, intimate relationships with others. It doesn't come easy for us. Uh, it shouldn't surprise us then that Americans, studies show, feel more isolated, more lonely than other cultures do, less connected, more empty, even though we have more stuff or the opportunity for more stuff. Again, personally, I like our culture. Uh, of course I like it because it's mine. But there are some good things that flow out of this, obviously. But um, my point is I think we tend to read, we tend to study, we tend to try and live out the Christian life through our cultural lenses, and we don't even know it sometimes. So when a passage like this this morning and where Peter's going to keep going, uh, sometimes we're not really living it out, certainly not believing it, certainly not fleshing it out because of our culture. Think about it. This study has been done over and over. Americans, we try to run our churches, our churches like a business. Some non-Western cultures look at the way we do church and they think it's horrible. Americans run it like a business. Africans run their churches like a family. They call that the biblical model. Cross-Cultural Missions Conference, I love this. They, they talked about the story. There was pastors from all over the world there, Eastern pastors, Western pastors, and they studied the uh, story of Joseph in the Bible. And then they asked them all, what is the main point of the story? What is the point of this very biblical story of Joseph? Western pastors said this, the faithfulness of God. Same story, same study, same teaching. Eastern pastors said, uh, pastors said this, the point of the biblical story is that Joseph took care of his family. Wow, think about that. I mean, when I heard that, it, it knocks me off my chair. Just think about that. Uh, exa- uh, a pastor was given, some money was needed to dig a well in a village. The pastor was given the money, and the pastor takes the money, and instead of building the well, he gives the money to a person in need. Right or wrong? The West said this, horribly wrong. Disgusting. The East said this, absolutely right. Absolutely right. Now, you just see my point here, showing the different cultures and how in our Western culture, we're going to read things through our culture and we need to be careful of that. Um, this uh, from Malcolm Hartnett. I had to go through, Phil came in my office. I was whipping through his old notes and I found this note from my professor. Uh, individual, cultures that uh, gear towards the individual. We go for individual identity is distinct from others. The group or tribal culture, individual identity merges with the group. Individual is individual rights, accomplishments are valued. The other one, group welfare and accomplishments are valued. If you're going to help the group, that's what matters. That's what makes you special. The other one, individual sacrifice relationships for individual achievement. The other one, sacrifice individual achievement for the whole group edification. Individual nonconformity is admired. The other one, nonconformity is shunned. Shunned. Morality based on individual sense of guilt. The other one, morality based on shame brought on the group. So they're going to make things legal or illegal depending on if if I break this law, it's going to make the whole group look bad. Whereas in our culture, if I break the the law, it'll make me, maybe my family uh, look bad. The highest nail gets hit the hardest. Think about that. Here's the issue. Our culture, how we raise our kids, many times we want to stand out. Other cultures, it's how can I fit in? With the latter mindset, think about that, fighting sin together, confessing our sins one to another. Uh, In chapter 2, verse 4, as you come to him, which is plural, as you come to him, how can I edify the group? Think about it, in an individualistic culture, we're going to come to church seeing, what do I get out of it? I mean, that happens all over our nation. What can I get out of it? It's not about me when it comes to worship. That's how other cultures are going to look at it. Now, in Peter's context now, thinking about the group, I am just one stone among many. I am just one priest among many. I am just one citizen among many of the same nation of God. I am part of a bigger picture. So how can I lift up? How can I support? How can I edify? How can I encourage the other stones, the other priests, 
the other citizens. Peter says in verse 4, as you come to him. That's a worship word. We actually get our word for prostrate from this word. And I hope I said that one right. See, think about it. This whole passage here is what does God do through community? And if we have a hard time culturally speaking of even thinking about community, I mean, we get to that eventually. But if our lenses are always individual first, we're going to read that individually. Here's what God does through community who come together to worship. Worship is this. You all come in together. You come together, plural, coming to him. Uh, years ago, I gave my definition of worship. Uh, this is pulled over from, from, all, from all over the Bible. It's an act of reverence. So when I'm singing to God, it needs to be an act of reverence. Uh, I get that out of 2 Samuel 6 and 7, uh, 8 and 9 there where David, uh, remember he's going to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem? And as they're bringing it back, that guy Uzzah goes to brace the Ark of the Covenant because the mule are slipping. They're basically doing it wrong. He goes to touch it. God kills him instantly. Freaks David out. What kind of holy God are we serving here? So it goes to this guy Obed-Edom's house. Um, then they come back and they're going to do it the same way now. The only difference now, one way was irreverent, the other way is reverent. They're still dancing and singing and praising on this side. It's a wild time of worship. But the only difference, no one's going to die on this end because they're doing it reverently. Remember, every step they're praying, they're focused on God. That's an act of reverence. So worship needs to be an act of reverence made in response to God's revelation. So God reveals himself. People are going to fall at the end of the age. No matter how hard your heart is, you're going to see Jesus. You're going to fall on your face. This time now, as God reveals himself through his word, through good works, uh, John chapter 9, the, the guy who is blind, right? He sees, I don't know who Jesus is. He, he goes the whole progression through John chapter 9. Jesus was just a man. Jesus was a prophet. Then he calls him Jesus as God. When he calls him God, God is revealed. What does he do? He worships. So it's an act of reverence made in response to God revealing himself expressed as an offering. So if I really see who God is, I'm going to offer him something. Throughout the Bible, we offer God different things like money, stuff, our time, good works is an offering. It's a sacrificial offering. Uh, in fact, verse 5 says this. Look at this. Um, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That's not just Sunday morning. That is your whole week. In your whole week, you're making offerings to God, offerings of sacrifice through Jesus to God. It happens throughout the whole week. Could be praise, could be songs of worship that Jed leads us through. Romans, Paul tells us, is, uh, we offer our bodies as living sacrifices. As we all come, what does God do? As we all come together, what does God do? With community in mind, here's what God does. He's building a building. He's enlarging a family. He's expanding a nation of worshipers. That's what God is doing. Through loving acts of kindness, through good works, through random acts of kindness, through praise, through encouragement, through words and actions, through worship, God is doing something. He's building a building. He's expanding a nation. He's enlarging a family. You look at verse 4, what God thinks of God the Son uh, rejected by men, talking about Jesus, the living stone, chosen by God and precious to him. Then notice down in verse 7, now to you who believe, this stone is precious. So God the Father thinks Jesus is precious. We as believers think Jesus is precious. Jesus, the living stone, is precious to God the Father. Jesus, the cornerstone, is precious to us. I like how the Bible talks about saved and unsaved people. When he talks about Christians, they don't just say Christians. It's those who believe Jesus is precious. Isn't that wonderful? Ugh. We who are believers think Jesus is precious and we build our lives, therefore, on Jesus. Jesus is the cornerstone. We're building our lives. See, it's not just Sunday morning. It's how do I fit in throughout the whole week. Those who don't believe Jesus is precious, the passage here says those who reject Jesus, Jesus is either, going to be a, is either going to be an object of worship or he's going to be an instrument of judgment. Think about that. That's verse 8. Somebody's going to stand before Jesus someday. They're going to be so overwhelmed. They're going to fall on their knees. They're going to confess, confess he is God. But because they didn't see that in this life, he is an instrument of judgment. If he's precious to us now, he's an object of worship. So really quickly, we're going to close with this. Our identity, we are stones in the same building. That's verses 4 through 8. You're, you're um, 
uh, bulletin says that, your outline. God builds as he, we reveal him. We are a spiritual house. We're no longer a physical house. Back in Abraham's day, Abraham would leave sacrifices all over the place, right? He built an altar to God. Then he would leave go to another place, build an altar to God. Then he would go to another place. Uh, God said, okay, stop doing that. Have one central location. So Moses does this whole tabernacle thing. David brings the tabernacle in, then he wants to start building a temple. Solomon is allowed to build the temple. That is going to be the place, the center location where God's name is. It's the place of God's presence. Now it's not about a building. Think about that. We are all a spiritual house fitting in together, and then we go and live our lives spreading that spiritual house. The place of God's name is not a building. The place of God's presence is not a building. It's you and me. As we go to our neighborhoods, as we go to our work, as we go to our workplaces, as we do our hobby thing, it's not about a building. It's a community of faith infiltrating the darkness with God's name and God's presence. I mean, this is huge. Huge. Not about a building. <clears throat> uh, we, need, we need to make sure we have all of your email addresses because uh, the elders are working on, uh, we have to do something or we're going to get booted out of this place if someone buys it. We've been checking different locations, different sites, including this one, and uh, we are praying about what we're going to do. Uh, when we come to that decision, we're going to need your input. We're, we're gonna have to, we want to tell you, communicate with you what we're thinking and what we're doing, and then you'll have the opportunity to tell all the leadership team what you're thinking or maybe something we're missing as we make this decision. But make sure we have your email addresses because there's a whole lot of people that left and went back north and northwest, so we're going to be sending this out, and then you can contact us, okay? You got that? Not about a building, but we're going to need to do something as a church home, church family. P Peter wrote this. 62 to 64 AD, uh, six to eight years later, they're going to destroy the whole temple, destroy their whole place where they met and worshiped. A lot of times they met in houses. Uh, they were spread abroad, obviously. They would meet in houses, but there was that central location, Solomon's porch they would meet in. Peter knew the temple is going to be crushed, absolutely destroyed, but it's not about a building, he said. I mean, here's a Jew that knew that already. It's not about a building. We are stones in the same spiritual house. We believers who think Jesus is precious are the very presence of God. We are the temple. So now go out into the darkness, stones in the sun temple. Uh, God is, we are being built up. God is in the process of doing that. Quickly, we are priests in the same family. Back in Old Testament times, you had to be Jewish. You had to be a man. You had to be from the line of Aaron and the tribe of Levite. Um, today, Jew, Gentile, man, woman, we are all priests. Our job is to point people to Jesus. Not just in church, go and be priests. We are all priests, make his presence known in the church, in the darkness, in the community. So what God did is he turned observers, remember you had to be male from a specific tribe, God turned observers into participants. Go and join the fun, he's saying. Um, I really feel sometimes I walk into people's hospital room who are suffering tremendously, and it's like walking into the Holy of Holies. I mean, you just sense God's presence there. What Peter is telling these people who are suffering, who are in pain, who are going through a horrible time, you're God's very presence. And somehow, some way, through pain, through suffering, we just kind of shine God's light a little bit brighter. Some people don't. Some people do. And God said, you are the very Holy of Holies. You're the presence of God in his glory, so go and spread it. Go and spread it. We are all part of the action now. Um, lastly, we are citizens of the same nation. That's verses 9 and 10. Bring it all together. Bring it all together. We are priests. Our calling is to point people to Jesus out there in the darkness by the way we live, by the way we rub against culture, by the way we shine in the darkness. Uh, Old Testament, if you read it, the Levites are over and over and over again. In fact, if you read the Pentateuch, you kind of get sick of it. Because they keep saying over and over and over again, the Levites get no land. No land. Their inheritance is zero property. Uh, but then it says God is their inheritance. So now think about it. New Testament times, you lose everything you have. You're suffering. But because Jesus is precious, God is your possession. And together we all do life, even in the great USA. Let's pray.